Hi guys, welcome to another episode of It's Critical. I'm your host Kritika Singh and with us today we have Mahesh Kothamangalam. Born and raised in Hyderabad, India, Mahesh completed his studies in India and in the US. Currently, Mahesh is based out of Vancouver, Canada and is here to talk about his documentary Slice of Life his transition into plant-based and vegan lifestyle, the third wave coffee culture, and more. Let's hear more from Mahesh himself. Happy listening! Thank you so much for coming on board and doing this episode with me. I hope you're safe. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I am I am in a safe space uh, right now because you know, we're in Canada and Canada has handled the, the whole coronavirus situation in a much better way than the rest of the world. And we're able to move around easily with freedom, I guess. I'm actually glad to hear that. Uh, we do have restrictions, but nothing compared to what the rest of the world is going to. So before we indulge in our questions, I would like to know a little about you and uh, what motivated you to get into filmmaking. Okay, so I grew up in Hyderabad in an Orthodox vegetarian family and I know I ate vegetarian food until late teens and in college is when I started eating meat and for the next seven or eight years of my life I ate meat three times a day. Uh, I had to have meat, <laughs> that was my thing. And I think I was obese by the end of it. I was lethargic. I gained so much weight that I had lost interest in a lot of things in my life. My lifestyle was in, in a very bad shape. But uh, one fine day, I think I was eating a piece of chicken and uh, I was happy to, I happened to scroll through Facebook and I saw a video of a chicken getting slaughtered. I think there was Peter's uh, ad campaign or something that they were doing. And uh, something didn't make sense in my mind. I've seen chickens getting slaughtered in my life uh, growing up in Hyderabad, you go to the butcher shop and you pick up chicken, right? So then somehow something uh, switched switched off in my head. I was like, you know what, this doesn't make sense. So I kind of did more research on it. I uh, started looking at a lot of videos. And I think over, over a period of the next six or eight hours that night, I completely became a vegetarian again, and this time for the right reasons. And six or seven years went by after that. I was a vegetarian. I was still eating eat eggs once in a while. And then I happened to come across a Mercy for Animals video where a dairy cow is getting slaughtered. And again, went to my research, a lot, a lot of research looking at dairy consumption and what, what kind of health consequences we end up having. So doing all of that, realized that dairy is not even required in my body anymore. So I kind of cut that out. Then something hit me. I'm like, you know, these videos impacted how I live going forward. So I thought maybe I should do something in the documentary space to raise awareness. And I saw the other documentaries who were doing similar things, like Cowspiracy had just come out in 2015 or 2014, and they were focusing on the environmental aspect of it. And then I watched Earthlings from, from the late uh, 2000s, I think, and they focused on the ethics part of it. And then I think What the Health just came out later on, and it was all about health. But when I thought, okay, these are all t tackling the problems, nobody's really talking about the solutions, right? So we just can't say eat vegan. I wanted to show what can you eat as a vegan. In my own journey, trying to figure out what I can eat, I thought, you know what, let me just pick up a camera, talk to people, get some thoughts from experts rather than me telling people how to eat. Let the experts talk about this. And at the same time, I started seeing that local restaurants in my uh, city, in, the, in Minneapolis at the time, they started serving vegan food. Uh, vegan burgers were coming out. And uh, the vegan butcher shop, uh, the first one in the U.S., came out around the same time. So I saw this trend happening. So I wanted to capture all of that in the documentary. And that's how uh, the idea for the documentary was conceived. And like I said, 2015, 2016 is when I started doing the first round of interviews. And then this thing just blew up over the last... Uh, five years, I think you could see that veganism has taken taken over uh, all over the world. Uh, most restaurants are serving vegan food. At least one menu item is going to be vegan. Uh, the plant-based meat market is exploding. Uh, plant-based milk market is exploding. So I wanted to capture all of that, and that's kind of what I did. Even when in our daily life we talk to people, the first thing that they ask is, if you give me alternatives, I might just switch. You know, if anyone wants to know about the alternatives, like your documentary can be a solution to just share that link and for them to even go through and look at um, how they can transition into a plant-based diet. Absolutely. Moving forward to my next question, I think uh, you 
almost answered the second question also but uh, what prompted you to you know get into the food space um as a foodie obviously that was going to be my focus but i think i was just looking at the larger picture um uh, do people care about the environment yes but it's a small section of the population do people care about health again it's a smaller section of the population until you're sick you really don't worry about your health but food is something that everybody eats at least three times a day most people are lucky enough to eat three meals a day so i thought if we can make a difference there like providing information where it makes the most impact i thought that was the goal and like i said food was exploding all over i like eating out so i started going out to restaurants and asking for vegan food and they were easily accommodating so i i, I thought this is the right message to convey through the documentary and it was the easiest thing to do because all I had to do was talk to a whole bunch of people about what they ate, why they eat a certain way, and what made them change their lifestyle. So I just wanted to bring that out. And another aspect of this that was, I think, found common in everybody that I interviewed is most people, almost 90% of the people that were interviewed for the documentary, they were all heavy meat eaters. They grew up on a farm. They used to slaughter animals. So they all come from a background that is completely different from what they're living right now. So I think that's something that might connect with the audience. And hopefully it did <laughs> with the movie, but I think that was that was the intention, right? So I met uh, Dr. Neil Bernard, who was like the seventh generation cattle rancher who grew up in South Dakota, but he became one of the, the prominent voices for a vegan lifestyle now. So I think just that transition kind of, you know, was uh, appealing to me. And I think one of the instances that he mentioned to me was, he mentioned something, he was interning at a hospital um, in his younger days, right before he was getting into medical college. And one of his doctors asked him to cut open a dead body uh, right at the heart. And when he opened it up, he saw all these gooey stuff in the heart. And uh, the doctor told Dr. Neil Bernard, uh, who was the intern at the time, like, uh, do you know what that is? It's like, no. Like, that's your bacon and eggs that you eat every single morning that's showing up in your heart as fat. And that's kind of a trigger point for Dr. Neil Bernard to change his uh, thinking about medical science and how uh, food could actually heal. And I think that kind of, you know, became a center point for his uh, studies after that. So I, I thought, you know, it's, it's, it's the most common thing that everybody can relate to. And that's when I went out and started showing there is food available which can be better, healthier, delicious, and better for the environment. It doesn't have uh, any ethical consequences of eating animals. So why wouldn't you? That's kind of the, the, the and intent. And the food that also heals your body, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And I had the best time, you know. It's, it's just, just learning so much about vegan food, and I had no idea there was so much good food out there. You kind of think about food, uh, when it comes to vegan food, at least it's just taking meat out of something, right? That's not how the rest of the world is thinking about vegan food. It's about just eating newer foods, newer vegetables, newer you know, newer recipes. It's just so much out there. There's just so much potential. So that's that's fascinating to me. You know, you've told me about how you spoke to the doctors for the documentary Slice of Life. So talking to the nutritionists or the doctors who are promoting plant-based life, what's the main difference uh, you could see or spot when they were talking about meat versus plant-based diet? So there's two different schools of thought here, right? So the doctors see patients who are coming to them when they're either sick or they want to get better, right? So when I talk to them, I ask them, so what's the most common theme that they see when they you know, meet with their patients? And most patients want to change because they're either in the last leg of their life or they don't want the disease anymore. So they want to, they want to transform their life. And I think medicines are great. Most doctors can prescribe a medicine. There's, there's a pill for everything. But then if you want like a long-term sustainable change and you don't want to be on medication for a long time, I think doctors starting to see that, hey, how about this? How about you cut down something that's bad? And this is across the board, not just vegan doctors cry veganism as, as a cure or prevention. It's any doctor. I mean, I know people who eat meat, uh, who go to doctors for autoimmune diseases. Those doctors have asked them not to eat meat or cut down it. So that's kind of a theme that everybody knows about. Nutritionists, on the other end, can help you uh, in designing what you can eat tell you here are the foods that you can eat which will give you optimum health and then here are the foods you should avoid because these are causing kind of problems in your health so i think the it was very interesting talking to these people because even i was learning at the time uh because i like everybody else was eating fast food i was eating uh, anything that's available easily you don't go out and seek broccoli yeah. burger right so it's 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 not something you go out and do so once you start looking for recipes and starting to use new newer dishes 
uh, in your life, in your in your menu, that's where you will see that, hey, this is this is actually yeah. good. You know, there's a trial and error, but most times it comes out okay. And you're learning something new. So in Slice of Life, that's what we've done. I spoke to a cardiologist. I spoke to a gynecologist who takes, who uh, treats a GI tract and who spoke about how eating meat causes uh, protein uh, yeah. to stay in your stomach, in your intestines longer because it takes longer to pass through and it causes all sorts of heart conditions and blood blood flow issues. At the same time, I spoke to the cardiologist who spoke about the whole heart condition and uh, heart disease rates in the U.S., especially with, with the standard American diet. And um, I'm also thinking about a neurosurgeon who I spoke with who talks about how the brain uh, can't really handle heavy meat consumption. The brain stops functioning to an optimal level. Wow, because I, I always thought about it from a health perspective, but I never thought that brain perspective. I would love to be enlightened on that space also. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so um, I think we see a lot of ADHD in students. We see obviously attention deficits in kids these days. Uh, not saying everything is related to what we eat, but also I think how we live our lives. Right? We have smartphones everywhere and all that. But I think there's 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 certain foods. I, I remember growing up, my mom used to say, "Eating okra can make you good at math." I don't know if it's true, but I think that's that's my mom's way of telling me to eat okra. But I think certain foods have that magic pill or something in them that those enzymes, those nutrients that can improve your brain function, right? So I know Parkinson's uh, disease, I think one of the causes he, he is meat from animal products. So there is studies being done uh, and people are starting to see that what you eat actually impairs your brain function. So it's, it's important to know, just like how alcohol impairs your brain function, right? So what you put in your body is important um, for the rest of the body. So that, that helps. Wow. I mean, that's, that's a big revelation for me. And I think right after this episode, the first thing I'm going to do is read about how it impacts our brain. And uh, I hope that, you know, like me, there are other people listening to us who also get to know about this. How was the experience of uh, documenting food? And how tough or easy was it to get like stakeholders on board? Uh, let's talk about the two big names that I have in the movie, uh, mm -hmm. Beyond Meat and Impossible Foods. Uh, the reason I say they're big is because they're trying to do something different, right? Uh, they're trying to change the mainstream mm -hmm. food, which is beef. So that's where they are attacking. Mm -hmm. that's, that's their product line. So in the last five or seven years, from what I heard and what I was told by them is that they're in almost 14,000 restaurants just in the U.S. and they're expanding, they're, they're yeah. growing their uh, landscape, right? The biggest thing I found out from them is uh, their consumers, the, the consumers that they are focusing on is not necessarily vegans, but everybody, right? They can't just target a certain product uh, to their certain uh, target uh, consumer. They're trying to change what's the biggest product out there that's causing the most damage, beef, right? It's environmental aspects. It takes a ton of feed uh, to feed a cow and uh, the health aspects of it. Beef is probably one of the most consumed meats out there. So uh, the consumption of it results in large scale health epidemics. So I think focusing on all of those, these companies are trying to come up with something that's better, uh, that'll use fewer resources and uh, it's available at fast food chains like Burger King and McDonald's and Carl's Jr., where most of the country eats, at least in the U.S. Um, believe it or not, they sell millions of burgers a day, right? So even if, even if half of those are plant-based burgers and creating a larger impact, I, I know there are people who are opposed to the idea of creating vegan meats, but again, it's a solution to a problem. We're not saying, if you're eating meat, go whole foods plant-based. That's not going to happen overnight. These are transitional foods, and that's where they're supposed to be treated as. So if you want to transition from eating a, a cow burger, start eating a Beyond Burger or an Impossible Burger, and then switch over to something that's more healthier for you. These are not supposed to be three times a day. These are supposed to be once in a while when you have a craving. I think that's what, that's what the demand is. Uh, that's what the, the demand is driving these products to come up in all of these different restaurants. And uh, from what I hear, the stock price of Beyond Meat has exploded. Uh, I think they started at uh, $28 to $29 of their IPO. Right now, they're at $140 a share. So that shows you that there's a demand. Another facet that was uh, imp important for me to learn is China is really big on plant-based meat. And considering what's going on right now with coronavirus, uh, they have Beyond Meat products in at least 15,000 outlets in Starbucks in China. So again, it's, it's happening all around us. It's, it's a matter of time before we see products like this come up everywhere. 
I know that India is ripe for this, and hopefully someday there will be a product out there that will replace maybe the most eat, uh, eaten yeah. meat in India is chicken. So maybe we can replace chicken with something that's important. I know Good Dot is doing an amazing job in India. Good Dot meats are great. So the more easier and accessible it gets, the more people would actually start trying it. So as I said, I'm hopeful for a brighter and better future. In addition to being accessible and available, I think yeah. uh, affordability is a big piece of it. And uh, right now, uh, a Beyond Meat burger might cost a dollar extra uh, than a regular beef burger. But if you're talking about yeah. meat that's been there for hundreds of years compared to something that's come up new, right? Imagine how a cell phone used to cost us a lakh before. Now it costs yeah. probably less than that because of the technology that's been spread out. So I think that's where it is. I think they're getting to a point where the, the prices will match a traditional meat product and then even come down as the demand grows. So it's, it's always the demand and supply. So what drives what is a tricky situation. But as more people ask for it, you'll see more of these products come out and there'll be more production and yeah. there'll be... The idea is to understand that uh, for us to even look at the p price coming down, we need to support these industries. Absolutely, absolutely. Oh, another thing I want to mention is yeah. uh, we spoke about the US, Canada and India and probably a bit of China, but I've been to Europe with the documentary, I did not film a much, uh, film, film a lot of uh, interviews there, but I did go there for my film festival. And what I noticed in Europe is just amazing. I thought US was leading the whole plant-based movement, but Europe is on, on a different level. Every restaurant that I went to, uh, they had vegan products. Uh, every coffee shop, they had uh, plant-based milk. Um, I was talking to a bunch of restauranters and uh, coffee shop owners and I casually talked with them and asking them, what kind of sales do they see in plant-based milk? Almost 80% of their plant sales are for anything that they add to coffee. It's all plant-based. So I, I think uh, milk is a lot easier to give up for a lot of people. And that's where we see dairy, uh, dairy sales going down and plant-based milk going up. Meat has a lot of cultural uh, attachment to a lot of people. So meat is associated with festivals for, for holidays. So it's a lot harder for people to give up meat. But then once you start finding the right product which tastes well, which tastes right and then costs the same as your meat product, then that's what you're going to go for. So At least in India, dairy is that what meat is to the Western countries. Dairy is the toughest thing to give up. I think with a few brands coming on board, like plant-based uh, milk brands, like Good Milk in India, I think we are slowly reaching or, you know, moving towards a more a sustainable alternative to uh, dairy milk. And I also asked you about how difficult or easy it was to get your stakeholders on board, right, for the documentary. So yeah. Not surprisingly, it was a lot easier than I thought it would be. Um... I did talk to uh, one of the admins for Ethan Brown of Beyond Meat. We took over a couple of meetings, uh, sorry, a couple of emails to get a meeting with uh, Ethan Brown. And when I met him, he gave me an entire 90 minute or two hour time frame of his day. And he was super nice. He was super generous with his time. He was, show, he was showing me around his facility, talking about why he uh, came up with the company, why he started the company, why he's focusing on certain products now. Mm -hmm. And what, what's the future look like, right? And same thing with Impossible Foods. He's a scientist. He used to be a scientist at Stanford, and now he owns Impossible Foods. And he came up with the product probably over a period of 20 years of research. So what I found fascinating about these, these pioneers is that they're down to earth, and they are um, doing the right thing. Most, most corporations are probably doing it for profit, but these guys are doing it for the right reasons, and that's what is amazing. And I think that's where they were able to give me time, even though I was a nobody asking them for an interview, they were, they were, they were obliged right away, and that was, that was really great. Uh, I did have uh, other restauranters who own like 15 to 20 vegan restaurants around the world, uh, like Matthew Kenny, for example. He owns restaurants all over LA, New York City, Dubai, and again, amazing gentleman. Uh, again, he grew up in, in rural America. He, grew up hunting and uh, he's a Michelin star chef and now he owns over 20 restaurants that are all vegan and that shows you that people are putting uh, where uh, money where their mouth is and it's just amazing how 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 they're changing the game how they're changing the landscape here when they start making products like that which are which are available everywhere and people start eating them a lot more and start seeing that hey there is this vegan food that's just absolutely delicious. I don't know why I was eating this other thing all this while. And that's where the tipping point happens and you'll see a lot more consumers out there. So yeah, it was pretty easy for me to get most of these guys on board. It was just a scheduling thing, but 
once it worked out and they were sort of super nice when I met them. I'm yet to see Slice of Life, but I'm super excited for you to screen it in India. <laughs> so when are you actually planning to screen it in India? <laughs> Thanks to COVID, uh, all of my plans for screenings have been put on hold. Um, so let me back up here. So last year, August is when uh, Slice of Life had its world premiere in Poland at a film festival. And in October last year, we did a Vancouver screening. Uh, it was a Canadian premiere of the movie and it was sold out. We, ha we had over 200 people show up. There were lines out the door and uh, amazing reviews after the movie, which was surprising to me because as a first time filmmaker, I was, yeah. I was worried about how the people will receive it. But I got rave reviews. Everybody commented uh, me on, on, on the hard work that I put in because it was a one person crew uh, for the filming. It was uh, entirely self uh, produced. I directed the whole thing. Uh, the only thing that I kind of outsource is editing. And uh, yeah, so we started off from Poland, went to Vancouver, then we did a screening in San Francisco, and then in Austin. And the plan was to screen it in New York in April. End of April, the plan was to screen it in Los Angeles. And uh, in May, I was supposed to go to London. And in July, uh, I was supposed to come to India and have a screening there, uh, at least in Hyderabad, Mumbai, and New Delhi and all of those plans are put on hold, but I can't wait to bring it uh, uh, to to my country, India, and I hope uh, people receive it just yeah, as well. And the people who have been following uh, Slice of Life on Instagram or other social channels are super excited to and curious to know about what's actually in the documentary and you've been winning awards so it's all the more you know uh, raising our curiosity all the more to even know what's what's in there yeah yeah and right now i can say that it's available in australia and new zealand i know it's not india but uh right now it's available on a streaming platform uh in australia and new zealand it was just purchased by films for change i think it's called um, the, the platform and what they do is they put all the films that are trying to make a change right so they have environmentally related uh, uh films they have human trafficking related films uh they have animal rights related films so i think that platform is growing but uh they were they approached me about two months ago and right now slice of life is available there like I said, I can't wait to bring it to India. The, the plan is to get it on Netflix and Amazon at some point. But I'm holding it dear to my heart right now because I want to screen it in person as many places as I can because I like the interaction that we have. What we do is we just don't screen the documentary. We actually have a Q&A session with local panelists. So we bring in a nutritionist or a vegan bodybuilder or we bring in a doctor or a local um, restauranter or a food company CEO because we want to make it, make it an event. And most of the audience members who have watched the movie so far, almost 60% of them are non-vegan or they're curious about eating vegan lifestyle, right? Or leading a vegan lifestyle. So when they come in, they see the movie, they get all the, the information from these panelists. They also get to eat amazing vegan food that we serve at the, the, the event. So we make it an event. We make it a three to four hour long event. Uh, we, we want to meet with people. We want to make it a community space where people can interact easily. So I think that's kind of the message of the movie and how we want to uh, come across. Uh, I'm only waiting for you to screen it here and I hope I'm in <laughs> invited for your <laughs> screening. Absolutely. And that's... You'll get two free tickets. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. I'm, I'm already <laughs> delighted. Before we move ahead, I think there's a small rapid fire round that I'd uh, like to, you know, have. And uh, I'll just uh, give you a word and you'll have to give me one word answer. If okay. not one word, a phrase is okay. okay. So whenever you're ready. Okay. The first one is desire. Car. Uh, no, no. Frog. Frog. Alligator. Want. Need. Sustainability. Critical. Food. Love. Meat. Like the dairy and meat industry. Meat. Archaic. And uh, veganism. Passionate. Passionate. Well, thank you so much. I think uh, it was very swift and uh, easy going, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on, Mahesh, uh, for someone who's not a plant-based eater, uh, what will that one message from your end be? I would say ease into it. Um, not everybody is going to leave uh, eating meat or I think it's not just eating meat, right? It's, it's something that you're changing about yourself, right? Mm -hmm. It's as yeah. close to you as waking up and brushing your teeth, right? You just go for the right foods that you've been eating all your life. 
So I think easing into it is going to be key. Uh, not everybody's going to leave it cold turkey, as people say. Um, in my case, I was able to ditch meat uh, cold turkey because it was, it was the right thing to do. But then giving up dairy took me almost three months because I was like, do I have alternatives? Is it feasible? Is it something that I can, I can do? Is it something I want to do, right? So the message would be to learn. Um, nobody can change uh, how you eat. It's up, it's up to you how you want to live. And it can, people can influence you. I know celebrities might have something to do with it or something somebody you, you look up to might influence you to make the change but i don't know if that's going to be long-term um, change so what you can do is actually learn why you want to change and see if that's the right thing for you to do if it doesn't work leave it try to try to do it again in a few months but i think yeah easing into it give it the right right effort you know nothing in life comes easy so why do you want to change something that's so personal to you like that right give it a thought make the right decision the idea is to keep uh, evolving and to make ourselves aware of the repercussions that m our eating consumption can have on the environment or the animals or to even our health yeah, yeah. so there's there's a lot of people who don't have the information right so they're living the way they mm -hmm. live because that's what they've been told it's cultural mm -hmm. it's something that get passed on from generation to generation so i was a vegetarian because my parents were vegetarian their parents were vegetarian yeah. not because of any other reason but then um any of these things which we have to go against the grain needs needs an effort personally right you need to actually make it a point to make that change we all sleep on the same side of the bed we all use the same coffee mug we all walk a certain way it's just we're so used to being in our own way and we're creatures of habit so these kind of things take time and i think getting the right support system would really help um and I think the reason why we want to make a change is extremely important. Just like how people uh, want to get the six-pack ab, right? Uh, but that's not going to happen overnight. You've got to work for it. So that's the same thing for anything in life. You want to really make an effort to get there. So, so yeah, hopefully, hopefully people can make the right decisions for themselves. Moving on, what's next for you? And uh, should we expect more documentaries coming on the line of food? Um, so the Slice of Life is my first film and I kind of walked into it, right? But then uh, I think, like they call it in Hindi, right, the Kida, right? And now I want to make another movie. And uh, since the, the, the second love for me in life after food is, is coffee. And I thought, how about I make a movie about coffee? And people start asking me, like, what's this going to be about? Is it just about coffee? It's like, yeah, but... You know, coffee has a production system. It's got an economy on it. Uh, uh, it's it's got environmental consequences. It's got uh, animal rights concerns because I know there are yeah. certain types of coffee that have uh, civet poop, right? So yeah. yeah, and then elephants are used in most countries, at least in the southeastern part of the world, where elephants are used to you know grow coffee beans, kind of stuff. So I think there's a lot of lot of aspects to coffee that we don't think about. And mm -hmm. I actually started filming for it in Europe. Uh, I went and filmed in Berlin, um, Poland. I was filming in Prague and a couple of other cities that I can't remember right now. But the intention behind that is uh, these coffee shops that I interacted with and interviewed, they were trying to do something different. Just like how meat is changing, coffee is changing. Yeah. You know, there's a lot more third wave coffee, they call it, where they're focused mm -hmm. on where the bean is grown. Uh, they want to focus on the farmers growing those beans and making sure the farmers are getting the right wages. Uh, they're focusing on the quality, just like how wine has like a distinct culture associated with coffee does have something to that too. There's coffee taste that people can actually do testing on, cupping, so they call. And I want to capture all of that and uh, kind of show like an all-inclusive view about coffee, which is part of everybody's life. Out of the 7 billion people in the world, even if 50% of the people drank three cups a day, that's a lot of coffee. So I want to capture the consequences of it, uh, whether it's environmental, um, whether it's health. Uh, we, there's Every day there's a new study coming out, coffee is good for you or coffee is bad for you. What is it? Nobody knows. But it's it's commonly available. You can get a cup of coffee for 50 cents or you can get a cup of coffee at Starbucks for $6. So there's, there's all these different aspects to it that I want to capture. And like I said, the filming of that had started, but then again with coronavirus, I had to stop filming this year. Otherwise, I would have gone to Peru. I would have gone to... Uh, Colombia, I would have come to India to go to Assam and Kurd. Uh, I want to go to Indonesia, to Java region to know about coffee there, interview Starbucks, interview uh, 
all these third wave coffee shops in Melbourne. So there's, there's a plan, but uh, it's on hold right now. So hopefully that's going to be my second documentary whenever it comes out. And by any chance, are you looking for interns or, you know, an assistant to help you? Because it looks like you are going to travel a lot in the coming years and <laughs> whoever travels yes, with you so... is going to... I, I mean, yes, I was talking so, about me. I, I was not talking about I, film <laughs> students. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, in interns are welcome. Um, <laughs> anybody who could hold a, a microphone up to the interviewer is welcome. Anybody who's willing to do all the hard work behind the scenes is welcome. Uh, anybody who's able to pay for their own travel is welcome. <laughs> I was so, dreading that. Was, yeah, exactly. So <laughs> it's, 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 it's a fun thing, though. You get to drink coffee everywhere you go. Most coffee shops where yeah. you meet uh, the owners are nice enough to offer you a cup of two of, uh, of coffee. So I've had uh, my share of coffee in Europe. Yeah. So, yeah, I think uh, till the time my expenses were taken care of, I was ready to be a part of it. But still, I mean... <laughs> I'm looking forward to joining you maybe here when you're in India and see how... On a more serious note, though, I think I'm hoping yeah. for a, some kind of a grant uh, from a university or even a coffee company, right? Saying, you know what, go out and do this research for us. You know, we want to know what the consumers are drinking. We want to know what yeah. brands is headed, right? Because yeah. I think it's time where chain coffee shops are coming to an end. They will still be there, but just like how McDonald's mm-hmm. Burger King is, uh, they're going to be there on the fringes. I think the main yeah. thing will be how coffee is produced even coffee day i think for, to a large extent people are tired of the same kind of coffee they want a variety of coffee right so i think that's yeah. where the, the movement is going and uh, i think just like anything else it starts in the west uh, i know australia is really big on uh, third wave coffee uh, europe is super big on this italy spain are uh, they making espresso machines dedicated for these smaller companies uh, they're inexpensive in a way and I think Starbucks needs to start thinking about how they want to change the game because things are changing, things are changing, the product line is changing. And even in India, I think uh, cities like Bangalore and Delhi are are seeing a new wave, like you said, third wave, right? Like, uh, I remember being in Bangalore and enjoying my cup of coffee more than thinking of going to a brewery and it's it's changing, we are seeing that change everywhere and all the best for restarting your schedule and your travel thank you thank you so much i'm looking forward to it so thank you so much for being on board mahesh and it was really insightful and interesting having this interaction with you i'm hoping our audience also gets to take back a lot from this interaction and uh, they also be excited and wait for slice of life as i am (laughs) can't wait to see that too thank you so much thanks for the opportunity Thank you for your time today. In case you would like to connect with Mahesh, you can follow Mahesh on Instagram. His ID is at the rate slice of life talk. It's at the rate S L I C E O F L I F E D O C. To connect with It's Critical on Instagram, you can visit at the rate I T S K R I T I K A L P O D C A S T. It's at the rate It's Critical podcast. To connect with us on Twitter, you can visit at the rate I-T-S-K-R-I-T-I-K-A-L-P-O-D. It's at the rate It's Critical Pod. To connect with us on LinkedIn and Facebook, click on the link in the description below. We hope you had a great time listening to us and we hope that you'll join us in the future too. Happy listening!